a pleasure to be on this uh, virtual training session with everybody and to be able to introduce the DE4000 uh, to who, whoever it may be uh, a, a new introduction and a review for those that have uh, been exposed to it before of some of our newer features. We've put a lot of work into our version 2.1 release and uh, included a lot of new uh, communication features, um, expanded the Modbus capability, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, um, and so I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, review the DE4000 uh, overall in general and also to uh, talk about some of the newer features and, and give you some exposure to some of that. So today's session will uh, will be intentionally intended for a, a very wide audience. Uh, so for those for whom this is new and for those who have been uh, exposed to the DE4000 for, for quite some time or have experience with it, um, so I'll ask your patience if, if uh, I'm covering things that you've uh, seen before, um, but for those that uh, that are joining us for the first time, I welcome you and uh, hope you appreciate what we're about to show this morning, this afternoon. Um, what you have in front of you, uh, as I share my screen, is the user interface for the DE4000. It's a web-based interface, um, and it's usable uh, not only through the touchscreen display of the D4000, but also through your uh, laptop and tablet devices. Uh, hey, Brian, takes one, one moment here. Your uh, your screen is not not showing up as being shared. There you go. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, okay. So um, with the DE4000, we're able to take advantage of, of the, the latest web technologies, and we've implemented that in, in our user interface. Um, this is the, the view that you get with a, with a newly commissioned uh, DE4000 panel that, that's not been configured. By default, it comes up with uh, a display showing the engine RPM, uh, and then some status indicators for the discrete outputs on the uh, controller module. Um, but this dashboard interface, as we call it, uh, is very extensible and, and configurable. Uh, it allows for multiple pages uh, of, of display elements to be added and, and grouped together. Uh, for uh, you, you, know, you could group items, for example, by uh, engine parameters on one page. Uh, Compressor uh, values and inputs on another page, and, and uh, external Modbus devices on a on a separate page. Um, but basically, this is this is where most of your interaction will be with the system, especially as it's as it's uh, up and running. Um, we'll we'll cover the other uh, configuration pages as well that are that are more involved in getting the system set up. Um, but the dashboard is allowed to uh, to present yourself and your users with with the view that makes sense for you and your application, so that so that you can see and interact with uh, the things that are most important to you. Um, you can always get back to the dashboard by clicking the uh, dashboard button here in the in the top left. Um, but but maybe the best thing to do to start out is if we just configure a couple of channels that we would have on a typical system. And then that will allow us to uh, show some of the other uh, functions and, and the other uh, pages. So we're going to go down here and start with the, the channels button. And the first thing to note on the channels button is there's a, a drop down here at the top left that says terminal one. And the hardware I'm working on right now only has one terminal module connected, but you can have up to five terminal modules on a DE4000. So the first step would be select the terminal mo module that you want to configure if you have more than one. And then this drop down shows all of the available uh, input and output channels for that terminal module. 
So as you can see, we have 32 analog inputs. Well, they're actually configurable inputs. They can be for analog or digital values, uh, but 32 input channels. And then we have eight discrete output channels and then four uh, analog output channels. And then each terminal module also has uh, two RPM inputs. These can be used for the uh, primary engine speed or engine RPM, but they can also be used for uh, detecting the, the rotational speed for other things like fans and, and so on, um, turbos and pumps or whatever whatever you might need. So for this example, we're going to configure a, a uh, suction pressure input on input one. So we select that channel and then we set the sensor, sensor type. So for this example, I'm going to set uh, the pressure, uh, set the sensor type to pressure. And then if you're using one of our uh, Altronic transducers, all of the uh, pressure ranges are, are available here in the drop down. So let's say we're doing a 0 to 200 uh, PSI transducer, we would select that. Um, and it comes up with all of the, the default values, which, which you can modify if, if you need to. Um, so we have our units of measure, which is PSIG, our display precision, which is uh, one decimal place. And then we have a, a low gauge range and a high gauge range, and I'll sh show you in a minute uh, what, what those uh, do for us on the dashboard page. But as we're finished with this, then we uh, just click the Save button to save that channel. And what you'll find is we can go back to the uh, dashboard page. And now that we have that channel configured, we can click the Edit icon, which is the little pencil icon here in the top left corner, and we can add a new display element to the dashboard. Now this screen at first looks a little bit confusing but it's set up in a rectangular grid and so um, where I have the engine RPM you'll see there's two icons over top of that display element. The, uh, the pencil icon allows me to edit that display element and the uh, trash can icon allows me to delete that element. And then I have two empty placeholder elements on either side of the engine RPM. So I can add another gauge here on the left, and I could add another gauge on the right. Uh, and you can put any number of elements on a line, and they, they just start to squish or condense and become smaller uh, to allow them to, to fit in the, in the available space. So what I'm going to do here on the left to the left of the engine RPM, I'm going to click this pencil icon to modify this empty placeholder element. And I want to add the, uh, the new suction pressure channel that I, that I just configured. So what I would do then is, uh, if I click the T1 filter button, oh, I see I did not, I did not assi assign that channel a label. So I'm going to go back to the channels page. And label this channel as suction pressure. And save that again. And then back here on the uh, dashboard, uh, again, I can click the edit button, but filter the available channels down to uh, terminal one. I choose the suction pressure. And then I can choose the type of display element. So in this case, I want to do a radial gauge. So I choose radial and I, and I click enter. And if I go out of edit mode, now I have my suction pressure displayed uh, as a radial gauge. And then as that pressure changes, you'll see the, the needle change and you'll also see the, the, uh, the actual value displayed as text below. Um, one nice thing about the uh, 
the dashboard view here is if I click on this display element, it just takes me right back to the configuration page for that. Um, now I mentioned the uh, uh, the display, um, the low gauge range and the high gauge range that are available on those con configuration pages. What that allows you to do is I'm using a transducer that's that has a full range of zero to 200 psi, but maybe I know that my that my suction pressure should only ever be in the range of zero to 120 psi. What I can do is I can change the high gauge range to be 120, and when I save that, then if I go back to my dashboard. Now my uh, suction pressure uh, gauge is, is showing 0 to 120. The transducer can still read values from 0 to 200, but this allows me to make better use of the, uh, of the radial gauge, so I'm not showing a, a large span that I know uh, I'll never use as far as the usable uh, range of the values that I expect to, to read on that channel. So I'm going to repeat those same steps and, and add a second channel. So in addition to using the, uh, the drop downs here to select the channel, uh, I can also use the channel left and channel right buttons down here. So this allows me to just quickly move between the, the channels. So from channel one, I can hit the right channel button, go to channel two, which again is not configured. And I can set this up a, as a pressure channel as well. And this time I'm going to label this as uh, discharge pressure. And in this case, I'm going to set the range from 0 to 2,000 uh, as, as far as the sensor type. But I'm going to um, set my high gauge range to, let's say, 1,400 PSI. And then again, if I go back to the uh, dashboard, I can add this gauge to the right of the RPM. And set that as a radial gauge again. So there I've, I've got my suction pressure and my discharge pressure on the dashboard in, in addition to the engine RPM. Um, so let's add a, a channel for uh, engine oil temperature. So in this, in this case, we're going to set it as temperature. And I could use a type of uh, K thermal couple, for example. Uh, set my units to Fahrenheit. Right? And I can set the um, let me put a label here first. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the high and low safety set points. Um, so I could set a uh, a high safety uh, set point temperature, say it's 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if I if I don't want to set a low uh, set point, I can I can just set a value that's low enough that I I know it'll never reach. Um, the other thing we can do is change the uh, input class. Uh, so if I wanted to make this uh, a class B, I could change that here. And then that allows me to uh, select a class B time, uh, which is the, the amount of time the sensor is allowed to be outside of its uh, safe range uh, on startup before it would uh, 
trigger a fault. Uh, and then I can do a class C, which um, is an input that can that can start out uh, as faulted, but once it reaches uh, the point where it's within its safe limit, uh, then then that channel becomes armed. Um, and then there's a, a a new option here that that uh, you may not have seen before. We can now disable certain channels on cooldown, uh, and so that's where we expect certain process uh, pressures and so on to to drop below their their typical safe limits when we're doing a cooldown procedure. Uh, so we can check that box, and um, that would allow that value to change um, uh, above or below its uh, safety set point on a cooldown without uh, causing a fall. I'll go ahead and save that. So in this case, I can add that new uh, engine oil temperature, and I can choose a, a linear gauge that shows uh, shows the numerical value, but also also shows a, a thermometer type uh, indicator. Now again, this is a good example of of uh, why we would want to use the high and low um, gauge ranges because it, it's showing uh, this large red span from from my high safety set point to the, the maximum value of 1200. Um, but I'm more interested in the the more narrow narrow range here from zero to 240. So I can go back to uh, the configuration page and set my uh, gauge range from 0 to 240. And now I have a much more uh, usable gauge there. Um, so that's that's how we uh, configure channels. Um, When we go to the values page, this allows us to see uh, all of the channels that are configured for the entire system without having to have them uh, necessarily be added to the dashboard. So this is a, a very handy page um, where we can kind of see everything at a glance. And we've got some filter buttons across the top here. So if we had multiple terminal boards and we only wanted to see values that were Related to the first terminal board, we can hit the T1 filter and see those values. If we only wanted to see pressures, we can uh, pre uh, click the pressure filter button. If we only wanted to see temperatures, uh, we can we can hit that button, or we can hit all to go back to uh, displaying all of the values. Um, the uh, if we have any class B uh, Panels. There's a there's a blue indicator that'll show across the bottom to show the uh, the, the class B timer for each of those channels as it uh, as it as the timer value uh, starts to expire during a startup process. So, um, so let's go into uh, as I've mentioned startup. Let's let's go into how the startup sequence is is configured and so for that, I'm going to click the startup button here on the left. And by default, we have a configuration that that just handles a typical configuration where we're where we're doing a, an engine uh, where we need to control uh, maybe a pre-lube pump. Uh, we need to power on the ignition and we want to power on a starter motor and so for for this uh, example, we're going to be using the four DS outputs that are on the controller module, and, and uh, by default, those we have indicators that are on the dashboard that, that show each of those, and 
Again, by default, they're typically labeled fuel, ignition, uh, crank, and pre-loop. So we're going to uh, stick with those functions uh, for this example. So going back to startup, you see that our uh, zero state is, I'm going to label this as uh, ready to start. Um, then we have a warning state and pre-lube and crank and so on, all the way up to state 8, which is our running state. So the, the, when we start the engine, the first state we will enter is the warning state. Um, the labels here is warning, and then we have a timer value that can be set in minutes and seconds. So if we wanted to yeah. activate a, a, a horn or a light to indicate that the engine's about to start, we can set that time there. And then we can choose an output that we wanted to turn on at the, at the beginning of that state. Um, so um, in this case, I'm, I'm just going to set that time to five seconds just so we don't have to spend a lot of time when I when I run through an example here. Um, so I can save that and then in the uh, in the pre-loop state I can turn on my pre-loop output which is DS4 and then I can turn that off at the end of that state so we can pre-loop for Let's just say 10 seconds. And then in state three, which is our, our engine crank, we want to turn on output DS3 to start the starter motor. Now, in this case, we want to leave this output on even after we leave this uh, state because um, we want to start cranking, then we want to turn on the ignition, then we want to open up the fuel valve, and then we then we need to wait to see uh, the appropriate uh, engine speed and RPM before we continue into the warm-up state. Um, so I'm going to check this box to, to turn the output on at the beginning of this state. Uh, but we'll leave that on as we continue through the next states. And so we only need to be in this uh, state for just a couple of seconds just to allow that the starter motor to, to start cranking. So we'll save that. And then the uh, ignition, we're going to turn on uh, our DS2 output on the controller module and we can allow um, the ignition to be on for three seconds before we open up the fuel valve. So we'll save that and then if we go to state five, in this state we can open the fuel valve which is DS1 and we'll save that. And then in state six, this is already pre-configured for us, but we have a permissive. Um, permissive A is enabled, and it's it's looking at our RPM input on terminal module one, and it's look, looking for a value greater than uh, 400. So we'll stay in this crank weight state until we see that engine RPM, and if we never exceed that value. Um, before our timeout expires, which is set up here in the upper right corner, which is 20 seconds, if we never reach that RPM value of 400, then we'll have a timeout event, and uh, we'll go back to state zero ready to start with a fault message uh, displayed. Um, otherwise, if we reach that uh, permissive before that timeout occurs, then we'll proceed on to the next 
uh, to the next state. Now we had uh, started our starter motor, which was on DS3 at the beginning of the uh, state three, which was crank start. We want to turn that off regardless of, of whether we have a timeout or not, we want to turn off that starter at the end of this state. So we'll either turn it off and proceed to uh, state seven uh, and warm up, or if we have a, a timeout event, uh, because we don't reach our minimum RPM, we'll turn off that, uh, that starter output and go back to state zero. So we can go ahead and save that. Just give me one here. I need to, uh, I need to reconnect my RPM simulator. So just give me a, a second here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right, now I'm able to simulate engine RPM. We can proceed. So, uh, going back to our startup sequence, um, we can then set a time for uh, this warm up state. So, we're going to configure this as 30 seconds. And what we can do here is set a permissive where uh, we'll stay in this warm state until um, our engine oil temperature is greater than, uh, let's just say, 90 degrees. So what this allows us to do is we we will just remain in this warm up state indefinitely until everything's warmed up and our engine oil temperature uh, exceeds 90 degrees. So uh, that may take five minutes. It, it may take two hours. But regardless, uh, we'll stay in, in state seven with the engine running at its uh, idle speed. And then once this condition's met, then we'll continue on into our running state. So once I save this, we pretty much have everything configured that we need for a uh, startup sequence. We can go back to the dashboard. Um, you see that we have a, uh, a low engine oil temperature currently of, of three degrees, so it, it will wait for us. Uh, in that, that warm up state. So let's go ahead and click the start button. And we get a prompt, make sure we want, we actually do want to start the engine so we can click yes. And you'll see down in the display bar down below here, it tells us which state we're in as it uh, progresses through each of those states. So as we go into the pre-lube, we see the, the uh, indicator showing that our uh, pre-lube pump is running. Then we see the indicator that our starter motor has started. Our ignition uh, was activated. Our, our uh, fuel valve is open. Um, now it's in that crank wait state. It's waiting for um, that permissive uh, of 400 RPM before it proceeds to the next state. So I'm going to just leave the RPM at zero. And you see here that we have a fault timeout in crank wait state. So this time I'm going to reset that fault. And we'll go through the same procedure, um, but this time it'll start successfully. And, and you'll see that once we have that 
RPM of uh, 400 will proceed on to the uh, to the next state. Now we're cranking, so we've got some uh, RPM. Now we've exceeded 400 RPM, so we've gone into the warm-up state. And again, with the warm-up state, uh, we have to see that engine oil temperature uh, above 90 degrees. So it'll stay in that state. Oops. There we go. I'm going to change the uh, I'm not using an actual transducer here right now for this engine oil temperature, so I'm going to change this. There we go. Okay, so let's repeat that one more time. And it does not allow us to start if it sees uh, RPM on the engine. So turn that down and we'll go ahead and restart. And again, now as our engine oil temperature increases, once we exceed uh, 90 degrees, Oh, there we go. Oh, I, okay. Uh, so on the warm up, we also had a a a, uh, a minimum timer of thirty seconds. So it not only has to reach the uh, the ninety degrees, but then it has to. Um, then it's going to wait uh, a minimum of 30 seconds after that permissive condition has has met before it proceeds on to the uh, to the running state. So um, so anyway, I don't want to spend too much time there because this is um, things that we've we've shown before for a number of you. 
Uh, so I want to move on to uh, some of the newer features. Um, and so I want to talk about um, uh, the number of changes we've made in terms of uh, communication, um, networking, uh, wi our new Wi-Fi functionality. So um, a lot of this we're going to find if we go to global. Um, then let me just explain some of the uh, uh, some of the settings we have here under the under the system system settings under global. Uh, we have a system name and that's just an indicator for you to know uh, which system this this might be um, might be unit number 255 um, you can set the number of terminal modules anywhere from one to five you can set a global alarm output so anytime you have an alarm condition one of the discrete outputs uh, will activate so that can be uh, set there you can also configure a fault output so when the systems faulted again one of those discrete outputs would uh, would activate um, you can configure which is the uh, primary engine rpm and then there's a setting here to determine when you want the b timers on the on the class b channels whether you want those to start counting down uh, when the start button's pressed, uh, when we when we start to uh, crank the starter motor, or once we've exceeded uh, a certain RPM. So, for example, you could say uh, the the class B timers would start once we reach uh, that permissive value of uh, 400 RPM. Uh, and then there's a timer for test mode. Uh, which I'll explain in, uh, in a little bit, but that allows us to go through and test the, the uh, channels while the engine's actually running. But to keep things safe, we put a, a timer on that, and that defaults to five minutes. Um, so uh, we're going to save that. And then we'll move on to the... Uh, to the network settings. So the DE4000 uh, is able to act as a slave device uh, connected uh, by Modbus RTU uh, to a master device that's, uh, whether it's your SCADA system or, or a PLC or some other external device, you can configure the node number uh, or the Modbus address here in, in this example, we have it set as seven, so that would be a node ID or a Modbus address of seven, and then the Modbus uh, baud rate is the the serial baud rate that we're going to communicate under that Modbus RTU uh, connection. Um, the DE4000 then can also act as a master device to any number of slave devices that are connected uh, on the second uh, RTU port on the DE4000. Um, and we'll, we'll show you here shortly how that allows us then to uh, read Modbus registers on an external device and then display those register values on a dashboard screen. So this is where we set the those Modbus values um, we can then also configure a custom Ethernet IP address. And so this is uh, very valuable when you're connecting the DE4000 to um, a wired Ethernet network and you need the DE4000 to have an IP address that's within the range of all the other devices on that network. Um, so if your network is, is configured where all the devices have a subnet of 192, 168.0 and you want the DE4000 to have uh, an IP address on that subnet of 129 this is where you configure that uh, then you can also set the 
IP net mask and the IP gateway. Um, we've now enabled the uh, Wi-Fi uh, transmitter on the DE4000. So in addition to connecting to a wired network, you have the option to either leave the Wi-Fi disabled or to set it up as an access point or connect to an existing uh, Wi-Fi network by choosing a client mode. So let's let's say we want to configure the DE4000 to act as a as an access point. What this allows you to do is basically the DE4000 is going to create its own Wi-Fi network or hotspot that any other device can connect to. Um, so this is really really helpful if you've got a laptop or a or a tablet a tablet or an iPad you can connect to the Wi-Fi network and bring up the DE4000 interface screen on that wireless device and walk around the unit and um, trip your trip your limit switches or your sensors for example and make sure that on the display uh, that that it indicates that that those have been tripped. Um, or you know other other types of troubleshooting, it's it's really handy to be able to to bring the panel with you essentially, uh, and have the display right in your in your hand as you're as you're working on the the package, uh, without having to go back and forth to the panel and to to whatever you might be working on. So, with the uh, access point setting, you can choose the SSID that you want to broadcast so that uh, devices know uh, what network to connect on. So in this example, we're, we're using DE4000 as that SSID. The system automatically generates a, a safe, a secure password. Um, you can type your own password in, in there if you would like to, but it needs to be a minimum of, of eight characters. And then you can choose uh, an IP address uh, for the DE4000, and then it will also assign an, an IP address in this same subnet uh, to any device that joins. So the subnet in this case would be 192.168.222, and the DE4000 would have an, an IP address of 2 within that subnet, and then the first uh, tablet or laptop that connect are going to get the IP address of three and then four and then so on. So you can have up to eight devices uh, connected over Wi-Fi at the same at the same time. And then you can uh, choose the Wi-Fi channel that you want to use. And it's recommended that you, you choose channel one or channel six or channel uh, 11. And you can have multiple DE4000s uh, using those same channels, but um, if if you can keep those separated, it's it's preferred. But if you had six units, for example, you could put two on channel one, two on channel six, uh, and two on channel eleven, and they they would still interoperate without um, without conflicts. Um, the the main thing you would want to do is make sure that you assign a unique uh, SSID to each of those DE4000 units that are all uh, within range of each other. Uh, so when someone goes to connect, uh, they can use the SSID uh, to know which uh, which DE4000 they're connecting to. So those are the uh, network settings. What I want to do now is show you an example of how we can use the uh, these Modbus uh, settings in the new Modbus functionality to uh, monitor an external device uh, using the DE4000 and the uh, dashboard pages. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and save this configuration here. So what I want to do in this case, uh, under global, I want to click on external devices. So for this example today, I'm, I'm going to be using our uh, Altronic EPC50 uh, air fuel ratio controller. And so what I'm going to do is add this as an external device uh, on the Modbus uh, network. And I've already 
uh, connected the EPC50 to my DE4000. Um, but what I have to indicate here to, to act to add this as an external Modbus device, I have to tell the DE4000 what node number the EPC50 has uh, on the Modbus network. So that would be node 5. And in this drop down here, I can choose a profile um, to tell it what type of external device it's connecting to. So the profile defines all of the channels that are available for that external device. So we've started to create Modbus profiles for, for all of our Altronic products. Um, and so you can see we've got an option here for the EPC50. We've got an option for a, a CAT G3606 Atom controller, um, and even an option to connect to another DE4000 as an external Modbus device. So I'm going to choose the EPC50. Um, and then you can assign a unique uh, name, uh, but I'm in this case, I'm just going to leave it as EPC50. And then when I add that, uh, then it shows up on my list of active Modbus devices. And so once I've configured this as, as an active Modbus device, I can come back to the dashboard. And what I want to do in this case is, is create a whole new dashboard page just for the EPC50. So I'm going to click the pencil icon to go into edit mode. And where this uh, this round indicator, the top middle of the screen, um, that's an indicator to show how many dashboard pages are, are available and which ones are being displayed. So by clicking plus, I can add a new dashboard page. And you could think of it as being to the right of the currently displayed page. So I'll click plus to add this new page. And now I can start a new row of dashboard elements where I have this plus sign here on the left. So when I click that, it's going to show me all the channels on all the different uh, terminal modules and virtual channels. And uh, to filter that down some, I'm going to click EPC 50. And then I can sort the channels either alphabetically, but in this case, I want to sort them by channel number. It'll just make it a little bit easier to, to uh, find the channels I'm looking for. So I want to find uh, first the supply input voltage. So this will show me the, the power supply voltage coming into the EPC50. And in that case, it's... Um, Here it is. It's uh, it's register thirty thousand nine. Um, so the way this is labeled, the MB five indicates uh, which Modbus port number, and then the thirty thousand shows it's in the thirty thousand block of registers, and it's actually register number nine. Uh, you may wonder why we don't just show that as thirty thousand nine as a single number, and the reason is is uh, um, we can access a total of over 65,000 registers in either either the 30,000 or 40,000 block. So we need a way to, to show a register number that's actually larger than 30,000 or 40,000. Uh, so we use a colon to separate the register block from the register number. But uh, if you're looking at a at a Modbus chart, you you may see this listed as 30,009 as a as a as just a single number. Uh, but once I add that, then the DE4000 uh, will start to pull that Modbus device. And then we should see that value uh, start to update once that communication begins here. There we go. So you can see that uh, that the Modbus, uh, the EPC50 is indicating that the supply voltage is 24 volts. So I can go and add uh, another device or another uh, register. So I'm going to again go to the EPC50, sort them by channel number. Um, in this case, I want to show the exhaust temperature coming out of the engine. And then I can add, 
add EPC 50, uh, the catalyst temperature, and then I can add the, uh, I want to show the oxygen uh, percentage, which is in millivolts. And last item I want to show is the valve uh, stepper motor position. And right here in register 17. There we go. So as you can see here, I can I can map any number of channels from a uh, external Modbus device and and display those. Uh, on a dashboard page of the DE4000, they don't have to be on a on a separate page. So you can you can mix and show side by side uh, internal values from the D4000 along with uh, external devices uh, external device values. So if you've got a uh, a Caterpillar engine and you're using the the Cat PLE and you want to be able to see engine parameters uh, such as uh, temperatures and and uh, maybe the engine speed and other other things that are coming from that cat ple uh, for the atom controller you can map those channels and show them right alongside uh, compressor pressures and temperatures uh, right on the de4000 uh, dashboard so um, we can also do the same with Modbus TCP. So I'm going to go to global, go to external devices, and I'm going to set up another Modbus device. Uh, in this case, um, I'm going to use the uh, IP address of the DE4000 because it acts as a gateway. So this also shows how we can how we can use the DE4000 as a gateway uh, to allow Modbus TCP requests to the DE4000 to actually be routed to uh, a, a device that's on the RTU uh, Modbus RTU network. So I'm going to connect and request registers from the EPC50, but I'm going to request those actually directly from the, the DE4000 uh, using a Modbus TCP request. Um, so the way you do that is you set the node number as the actual IP address of the device you're communicating and then you add an extra dot and then the uh, Modbus RTU node ID. So in this case it's 98102651 which is the uh, IP address, and then an extra dot five to show that it's node number five. Um, and we're still reading from the EPC 50, so I'll set that as the type. Um, and then I'm gonna give this one a name of just TCP, and I'm gonna, going to add that. Um, now I can go back to the dashboard, and I can click the right arrow here to go to my, my second dashboard screen. Um, what I'm going to do is just add a couple of the same channels, but this time I'm going to uh, click on TCP, uh, sort by channel again, and I'll select the supply input voltage. I'll do the uh, exhaust temperature. Now this um, uh, this Modbus TCP gateway functionality is not limited to displaying these items on the on the dashboard. Um, it can also be used um, for external devices like a SCADA system or or a um, uh, a PLC or some other external device that only has the ability to 
to do Modbus TCP requests to actually communicate with a, uh, a Modbus RTU device that is connected um, on the RTU bus uh, to the DE4000. So, so the DE4000 is able to act uh, as a Modbus gateway and and bidirectionally um, transfer that communication between Modbus uh, TCP and Modbus RTU. So now you can see on the screen, I'm 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 requesting and receiving Modbus data from the same EPC50, uh, but in these top two rows, I'm requesting that data over Modbus uh, RTU, and in the in the bottom row, I'm connecting I'm requesting that data over Modbus TCP, uh, and the the uh, DE4000 is able to seamlessly. Uh, route and and gateway those requests uh, regardless of of whether the, the device is connected uh, over Modbus TCP or Modbus RTU so um, that's uh, an example of of that um, and again I can use the left and right arrows to switch between the dashboard pages Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, output control. Um, this is used primarily for things like uh, valve control, uh, valve sequencing, and, and, and so on. Um, it's tied closely to our uh, startup state machine. So, uh, you know, we have state zero through state eight which gets us from from a startup request up to our running uh, state nine which is a cool down um, when we go to the output screen we can add a uh, an external device that we want to control uh, so again like i said for uh, for valve control um, and then we can choose how we want to control that device depending on uh, depending on our engine state. So what I want to what I want to do here, um, let's say we had a, a suction valve, and we wanted to control that uh, so that we would leave that that valve closed uh, until we reach our state 8 which is our running state what we could do then is is click add output and we call the output suction valve and the uh, the channel would be the uh, output channel that we want to control in order to activate that valve or, or open or close that valve so let's say we would put that on uh, Terminal one using uh, discrete output number seven. So we choose that. We set the type to discrete, and then it, the valve may be configured that that it opens when when uh, when the output is energized, or that it closes when the output is energized. So we want to uh, indicate that the valve is open. Uh, when this terminal one discrete output seven is is energized, um, and then that allows us then to uh, these drop downs below allow us to set the condition of that valve at each of our states in our startup sequence. So we can say here then that that uh, the state zero position is closed, and then state one through state seven we can leave as no change and then state eight we can say is open and what that's going to do then is say that any time we're in state zero or or any of the following states one two three four through seven uh, the valve stays closed and then once we reach state eight then the valve is open so i'm going to go ahead and add that I'm going to go back to my channels and under uh, 
discrete output seven, you, you can see it's uh, it's added a label there for suction valve. So I can go to the dashboard now and add a new element in this open space here, and it's on terminal one, and it's called suction valve. And I'm I'm going to choose a element type of valve which shows me with text um, either the, the word open or closed so I can see the condition of that valve. So again we're in our our state zero ready to start and it shows that that valve is closed so I'm going to go ahead and go through the start procedure and we should see that when we reach state eight which is running uh, then that valve uh, state should change from closed to open. So um, this example is just showing where you, you can make just discrete choices at, at each state, whether you want the valve to be opened or closed. But what's really powerful is you can you can create a script and we use the uh, the Lua, Lua scripting language, which we use extensively throughout the uh, the DE4000. And sorry, I was busy talking. I didn't turn on the engine RPM. Um, so we use the Lua scripting language uh, extensively throughout the DE4000. And what we can do with the output control is we can. Uh, we can use scripting logic at any of the states to determine whether the valve should be open or closed. Um, and I can show you an example here um, of how we do that. But let's first see uh, this first example here, how it works. So right now we're in our warm-up state. We have a 30-second timer that's counting down. As soon as that finishes, um, then we should reach our running state, which is state 8. And at that point, uh, you see that the suction valve changes from closed to open. Um, what I want to do now is I want to set up a... Uh, uh, um, Let's say that we have uh, a building that we're running uh, this engine compressor package in, inside of a building. And we have a ventilation louver uh, on the outside of the building. And let's say that any time the, um, uh, anytime we're running and the, uh, ambient temperature is greater than 100 degrees, we want to open that louver. Um, otherwise, if it's less than 100 degrees, we want to close the louver. And if we're not running, we want to always have that louver be closed. So uh, let's, let's first add a channel so we can monitor the uh, ambient temperature. So we'll go to channels, and we have an open channel here is channel number four. And give me a minute to configure this channel. Um, set the uh, units as degrees Fahrenheit. Call it ambient temp. So let's first add a indicator so we can see that temperature. So we want ambient temperature. We'll just display that as a value. Okay. So now that we're able to see that ambient temperature, let's go to outputs and we're going to add a new output. And 
we're just going to call this one louver and we'll choose uh, channel six energize to open and again we'll say that uh, in state zero it's closed state one through seven is no change and for state eight we're going to create a script and we'll save that and what you see here uh, on this screen is for each of these valve uh, each of these outputs that we've created the suction valve output and the louver output uh, there's an indicator at each of our engine states that shows uh, whether the valve should be open or whether it should be closed or whether it's controlled by a script. So for the suction valve at state zero, we show X, which, which means closed. And then the dot at the subsequent state means no change. So that just keeps you from having to, to, to set it for all those states. It's, so it's going to remain closed. And then the O in state eight shows that it's open. The louver is very similar in that state is closed. States one through seven is no change, but for state eight, in this case, we've created a script. So I can click the script editor icon, and this is where I would write my script. So my script's gonna be very simple. It's just gonna say if get channel val, one comma four is greater than 100 then return open else return close so it's just reading um, terminal module one channel number four and that's what this get channel valve function does it it uh, goes to terminal one channel four and and retrieves that value and then we're doing a comparison so we're saying if that value which is which is our ambient temperature if our ambient temperature is greater than 100 then we want to set the state to open otherwise we want to set the state of that output to closed so we can save that, that. And so now we need to add uh, an indicator for that louver output. So we'll put that on the dashboard screen and it's on terminal one. And it's our louver at discrete output number six. And this time I'm gonna use an LED indicator instead of the open closed text indicator. And we're in our running state, state eight, and our ambient temperature is 105 degrees. So we show that the louver is open. And then we should see that as soon as the uh, temperature drops below 100, then the louver closes. And then as it goes above 100 degrees, then the louver opens. Um, next week, we, we will be doing another uh, session on the DE4000. Um, the, the topic for next week is going to be all about um, scripting and uh, advanced uh, control strategies and, and algorithms. Um, so if, if this this type of uh, if this type of thing interests you, I invite you to come back and, and join our section session next week. Um, not only will, will I be on that session, but uh, uh, John Nance, uh, who is one of our field representatives, and Tim Webster, who is one of our uh, panel engineers, uh, will be helping uh, me with that session. And so we'll have a lot of uh, really good information and, and advanced information on Lewis scripting in general, as well as, as uh, some of the um, control strategies and, and different things that we've implemented with, with the Lewis scripting. Uh, we try to provide as much information as we can so that you can do a lot of the scripting yourself. Um, but we also have resources available if, if there's something that you need to, uh, you need our assistance uh, in, in doing a custom application. Um, you can contact our, our engineering department or the uh, uh, 
the, the panel shop and uh, get more information on uh, you know contracting those resources that you might need to to help you with uh, with those advanced uh, scripting applications so um, so that's a that's a couple uh, examples of, of how we can leverage the uh, this this output capability um, and and those were both just very simple applications but we've been able to do some some very complex uh, complex things as far as uh, yard valve control and um, and and even things that aren't uh, you know valve related just other more advanced control strategies and things using these uh, these tools that I've shown you here uh, the next thing I want to talk about though is um, we have a what we call a, a split range uh, control strategy that allows us to um, monitor up to two inputs such as suction control and discharge control and based on the status of, of those inputs uh, we can control the speed of the engine and also we can control an additional output uh, such as a recycle valve for example um, in order to try and maintain our, our process within within you know certain boundaries in terms of uh, suction pressure and discharge pressure uh, to the lot to allow the unit to continue to operate it at uh, you know its maximum output capacity but without exceeding the the limits we want to set on uh, on those suction and discharge pressures so um, for that we would go to control and uh, or, I'm sorry go to global and then control and as I said we can control on two uh, Conditions. So we're going to set the first. Uh, we're going to use our uh, suction pressure as the first input, and we're going to set that up to be linear. And we put two set points. So for the first, we're going to do a pressure of 20 psi, and for the second, we're going to do a pressure of 60 psi. And so what this means is that we have a linear uh, a linear mapping. Uh, so that when the suction pressure is at 20 psi, uh, our engine speed, for example, would be at at its lowest uh, rated RPM. And then when the uh, suction pressure is 60 psi, we would run at our our highest rated RPM. And then any value between 20 and 60, it's just going to scale linearly. Um, we can do the same thing with the discharge pressure and again we would do a linear relationship and it's going to be at the zero percent uh, or the low speed output when our pressure is uh, let's say 1200 psi um, and the engine's going to be running full speed when we're say at 800 psi and the uh, output channel we can choose one of our uh, analog outputs choose output 2 and then as I said it's it's a split range controller so we can split the range of the um, the, this range, for example, between 20 to 60 psi, we can allow the engine speed to be controlled across that entire range by setting this uh, from 0 to 100 percent, or we could set uh, set the range to be 50 to 100 percent, and then we could allow our um, recycle controller to control between 0 to, to 50 percent. So in this case, we could choose analog output 4 for the recycle controller, and we could set that to be 0 to 
So for this example, I'll need to add a couple things to the dashboard. So I'm going to delete some of these others. So there's uh, what we call a virtual channel. Uh, uh, feed target, which shows um, what the uh, engine speed should be driven at, depending on the, the condition of this uh, control strategy. So what we see here, if we go back to the uh, to the control page, um, our range of of uh, pressures for suction pressure was 20 to 60 psi. So as long as we're above 60 psi, we're not going to try and control either the speed or the uh, recycle valve, and the range on the discharge pressure was 800 to 1200 uh, psi. So if we're above 60 on the suction pressure and below 800 on the discharge pressure, um, then we should allow the engine to run at its at its maximum RPM, which is this value here, 800 uh, for the high RPM. I'm sorry, 1800 for the high RPM and 1,000 for the low RPM. So if we go back to the dashboard, um, if we get our suction pressure just above 60, you'll see that our target speed is 1,800. So that actually is, is showing us what the speed output is going to the engine controller. So maybe we're connected to a, a Caterpillar Atom controller with a 4 to 20 uh, output and so we're sending 20 milliamps to show that we want the uh, the engine running it at the uh, the maximum rated speed which which is 1800 rpm but you'll see as i start to drop the suction pressure um, that that speed target will drop down to a thousand um, so when I reach 20 PSI, which was the low uh, part of that range, uh, and there's a ramp rate involved, so we can control how quickly or slowly slowly it ramps up and down. Um, but after some time, you'll, you'll see that that speed then has dropped all the way to 1,000. Then as I increase the su suction pressure, uh, that speed will go back up again. And then as I increase the discharge pressure uh, above 800 PSI, then, then the uh, discharge pressure starts to take effect and starts to control the speed. And so you'll see the speed start to drop again as the discharge pressure increases. And then once the discharge pressure gets back below 800, that'll allow the uh, the speed to, to climb back up. Um, we can also, as opposed to, uh, instead of doing a linear relationship, we can configure a PID for each of these inputs. Um, so in that, in that case, you would set a single set point instead of having a range. So maybe we want our set point to be 60 psi, and we we want to maintain that pressure no matter what. And we can set the PIND factors uh, involved with that. And the same for the uh, discharge pressure, we can set that as a as a P, uh, a PID loop as well. Um, so so again, this this is a very a powerful feature that allows us to do uh, two channel uh control um two input channels and two output channels but but what's really um 
really nice about this feature is this this entire control feature and all of this user interface that goes with it um, can be completely modified and customized uh, again in our in our scripting language so just to show you um, if we go to global and go to scripts uh, we have four main uh, script editor pages basically where you as the customer can uh, write custom scripts so in this case if we wanted to, to modify the way this control strategy works you would go into control script and if you if you needed to do this we would provide to you the default control script and you could paste it into this window and then you could make changes to to that control script and by doing so um, you could modify and customize how this uh, split range control works and you you'd have full control to, to make it work any way you want so you can take what we've done as a starting point and and tweak it or modify it uh, or we can do that for you as well so um, if if what we've created here under this control strategy is 95 percent of what you need but maybe you want to drive a third output instead of just two outputs we could we could do that um, through that script editor um, and so I, I do want to talk a little bit more since I brought it up about um, the scripting and and those those different script editors that I just showed you so if we go to global go back to scripts um, like I said, we have four script editors. Uh, this master script um, allows us to write Lewis script to control uh, any aspect of the system, um, but it's different when we when we looked at scripting under the outputs and we created that Louver script. It was just a very specific script that only ran if we were in engine state eight. So if you wanted to control that louver, uh, let's say to to function all the time, regardless of what the engine state is, let's let's just look at how we would do that. So if we go in and copy this script here, and then let's just delete this entire uh, output control. Okay, so we no longer have a louver. Uh, output but now we can go to global and go to our master script and pasting in that same code the difference here is is this master script runs continuously uh, regardless of what what the uh, engine state is in in terms of our startup sequence so what this is going to do is anytime the ambient temperature is greater than 100 then we're going to open uh, that louver otherwise we're going to close that so if I save this script uh, under the master script and go back to the dashboard and add back in uh, an indicator to show that louver output and add back in uh, an indicator to show that ambient temperature and I'm going to change this louver to be uh, an LED again and this time I'm, I'm going to stop the engine so we're no longer in uh, state 8 but but that script is still running so now as I decrease the ambient temperature oops, oh that's right we can't we can't just say open or closed uh,
Just give me one second here to look up this function. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you see it's working again. So above 100 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, the louver opens. We get below 100, the louver closes. And if I go back to that script, um, all I had to do was was call this function set set discrete output value. So this is setting discrete output on terminal uh, terminal one. Uh, channel six and one uh, a parameter of one opens that output or activates that output uh, so when we're greater than 100 degrees we're going to activate that output uh, otherwise we're going to deactivate it by setting that output to a zero um, so uh, again the master script is running all the time you can still add code in there to to look at what what the engine state is, uh, you know, our startup sequence state. So you can still make choices based on, you know, if I'm in state seven, I want to uh, turn something on or off, or I want to change something. If I'm in state five, if I'm in state eight. So you can still do all of that type of logic, uh, but it's more general purpose instead of just being related to the output control like we like we saw before. So that's the master script. The control script, um, as I said, allows you to mod uh, modify and customize that, that split range uh, control strategy. Um, the Modbus script allows you to uh, completely customize or modify our default Modbus mapping or maintain our existing Modbus mapping but add additional Modbus registers. Uh, of your own. Uh, so if you if you're trying to replace a system with a DE4000, but you can't change the SCADA system, and and you need the Modbus registers to exactly match uh, what they were on on the device you're replacing, you could create a, a completely default a, a completely custom Modbus mapping by going into this uh, Modbus script and, and writing script code in there. Um, and so it gives you a, a lot of flexibility. We also have the ability now to, to handle Modbus, uh, Modbus writes. So an external device can write to the DE4000 and we can, we can uh, you know, trigger certain things or, or take actions based on the values that are written into uh, Modbus registers, and again, you have complete control over that with the uh, Modbus script. Um, the last script editor is is called the demo script, and that's something that's used on our virtual DE4000 platform, um, and that allows you to actually generate data that simulates uh, an engine or or compressor package, um, and allows you to respond to uh, events or or step through the entire startup sequence uh, using uh, script generated values. So if you're on the virtual platform, there's no there's no knobs to turn or or any way to to have you know real streaming data coming into the system, but you can generate that that data with the uh, with the demo script, and we can provide assistance for for anyone that would maybe need to be able to do that. So I um, appreciate your patience uh, staying with me through through all of this. I know it, it's uh, a large amount of data. Um, hopefully it's been useful for everybody. Um, for the last little bit here, though, I just want to turn things over. Uh, for anyone that might have any questions, feel free to uh, un unmute your microphone and, and uh, Speak up, and we'll do our best to answer your questions.
Excellent review as usual, Brian. Uh, any, Thank you, Brian. Question, any questions for Mr. Worth? You can just go ahead and hit your space bar if you'd like to unmute your microphone. Hi, Brian. Hello. Can you hear me? Sure can. Yes. Hello. Okay. I'm just curious under the outputs, how do you turn on and off an output on a shutdown when it's shut down in a shutdown state? So on the outputs, um, when when there's a shutdown, you're going to go you're always going to go back to state zero. Oh, okay. So whatever condition you set under zero is the condition of that output. Okay. Um, now you can you can replace that fixed condition of just open or closed with a script if you want. So let's say you wanted to do a um, uh, a post loop. Um, you could when you change state and stop running and go from state 8 to state 0 on a shutdown, you could have a script that is monitoring the uh, engine state and sees that it's transitioned from, from 8 to 0, meaning the engine uh, you know, has been stopped, and then it could start a timer of, say, 30 seconds and, and turn on your output, which maybe is your post loop uh, pump. And it could run that timer for, you know, for 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Uh, so, you know, that's an example of, of how you would do that um, uh, programmatically or, or interactively versus just a, a fixed condition of always turning that on or always turning that off uh, on a shutdown. So every time it shuts down, it goes to that state zero. It always goes to that state zero. That's correct. Okay. On the on the linear control versus PID control. Okay. When we do the PID control to a set point, mm -hmm. is there any way, or would it be possible to write a script to vary that set point dependent on I/O? Yes, we can do that. Um, we we've, we've actually just recently. Uh, implemented that for for someone else, and we've tested it and and have it working well. So, um, I'm sorry, I didn't see who was asking the question. That was Ken Swilly. Oh, Ken. Okay, yeah, we we can do that, and and uh, if you'd like, just shoot me an email, and I can give you more information on how to do that, and and uh, maybe provide some example scripts. Okay, I'll do that. Thanks. Okay.